If you think databases are boring, tell that to Larry Ellison, current net worth $200 billion. Yes, that's billions with a B. In this fascinating history episode, we'll look at one of the oldest yet critical technologies in computing, databases. From the first CIA-backed relational database to the massive distributed systems that power the internet today, databases have quietly shaped the modern world. All software products have one thing in common. Sooner or later, they have to store or retrieve data either from a file or from a database. The simplicity of storing data in flat files is appealing and even tech giants used this approach in their early days. However, once products grow in size, there is no way around using a database to handle all the heavy lifting of storing, retrieving and managing data. So even if you are launching robots to Mars, creating a simple web app or building the next indie game sensation, you have to know your way around the database. And I hope we can all agree that Microsoft Excel doesn't count as a real database. What's interesting is that even though the problem of storing and retrieving data appears simple at first, the solutions come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. That's because, as you'll see in the next few minutes, databases do way more than simply storing data. The story starts back in the 1960s, when computing was largely a manual, labor-intensive process. Data was stored sequentially on magnetic tapes, much like how audio is recorded on cassettes. To access a specific piece of data, you had to read through the entire tape until you reached the desired location. Of course, this made random access nearly impossible. Punch cards, on the other hand, were used for data input and program instructions. These rectangular card pieces contained holes punched in predefined positions, each representing specific data or commands. Operators fed the punch cards into machines, which processed the information line by line. While this system worked, it was slow, error-prone, and required a significant amount of manual labor. Retrieving data often involved sorting through large stacks of punch cards or rewinding tapes to the correct position, making efficiency a major challenge. Obviously, these methods would not scale as computing demands grew. Something had to change. The first real breakthrough towards modern databases came in the 1960s, when NASA faced unprecedented challenges as it worked to put a man on the moon. One major hurdle was managing the vast amounts of data required to design, test, and operate the spacecraft and related systems. This data ranged from engineering specifications and parts inventories to mission telemetry. Of course, the traditional methods were too slow and error-prone to handle the complexity of these operations. NASA needed a faster, more reliable way to organize and retrieve information. IBM was already a major technology partner for NASA, providing hardware and software solutions for various aspects of the Apollo program. Recognizing the need for a more advanced data management system, IBM developed the Information Management System, also known as IMS, to handle NASA's massive bill of materials for the Saturn V rocket. The bill included millions of parts and their hierarchical relationships, a challenge perfectly suited for the database model that IMS introduced. The model represented data as a tree-like structure where each record had a single parent and potentially many children. This was a significant improvement over tapes and punch cards because it allowed for more efficient data retrieval. The IMS was one of the earliest and most successful implementations of this model, enabling businesses to organize and query their data in a structured way. In fact, IMS was so successful that it is still used today. So if you want to bet your future on a stable tech that's most likely to never die, you can bet on IMS. However, the hierarchical model had limitations. Its rigid structure made it difficult to adapt to changing requirements. Recognizing these limitations, the network model emerged in the late 1960s. This model allowed data to have multiple relationships or pointers, making it more flexible than the hierarchical model. Still, working with these systems required specialized knowledge and was highly complex. The real game-changer came in 1970, when Edgar F. Cad, a researcher at IBM, introduced the relational database model in his paper, A Relational Model of Data for Large Shared Data Banks. Cad's model was based on the mathematical principles of set theory and predicate logic. It organized data into tables consisting of rows and columns, where each row represented a unique record and each column represented an attribute. What made the relational model revolutionary was its simplicity and flexibility. Unlike hierarchical or network databases, which required complex pointer-based navigation, relational databases used structured query language to access and manipulate data. This abstraction was developed by IBM's Don Chamberlain and Raymond Boyce to make it easier for developers to interact with data without needing to understand the underlying storage mechanisms. But, funny enough, IBM wasn't initially sold on Cod's vision, with Cod himself joking about the irony of being ignored by his own company. However, in 1973, IBM formed a team of relational database enthusiasts to work alongside Cod at their San Jose Programming Center. 
Their initial project was called Phase Zero and was designed as a proof of concept, which will then be discarded. It supported only one user at a time, just some SQL functions were implemented, and it was not able to perform joins. With the initial test successful, the team started working on a more complete database system that could handle real-world applications called Phase 1. All these efforts will culminate at IBM in the late 70s with System R, the first practical implementation of a relational database. During this time, one rich American called Larry Ellison saw the huge potential of relational databases and ran with it. In 1979, Oracle released the first commercially available relational database, famously labeled version 2 because Larry Ellison believed nobody would trust a version 1 product. This quirky marketing decision worked in their favor, giving the product an air of maturity while also helping Ellison secure some big first customers like the CIA or the US government. Weirdly enough, this is not the last time I'll mention the CIA in a database history video. After all, there is nothing more appealing than access to that juicy user data. Fast forward to the 1980s, and SQL became the universal language of data, with all big tech companies having their database solution. Microsoft joined the party with SQL Server, while IBM finally came around with DB2. But as systems grew, so did the need for performance. The introduction of indexes and query optimization made relational databases faster and more efficient. What's interesting is that this enterprise success brought in a new revolution, open source databases. The popular MySQL was released in 1995 and it was advertised as a fast, reliable and lightweight database solution. MySQL quickly gained attention for its performance and simplicity, particularly in the context of web applications. It became an integral part of the LAMP stack, a foundation for many websites and applications even to this day. Around this time, Michael Stonebreaker, a computer scientist at the University of California, Berkeley, released PostgreSQL, a successor to the Ingress project, hence the name Postgres. Fun fact, the Ingress project was funded by the Advanced Research Projects Agency and the CIA to develop relational database technology. So when you think about it, the tools that let you buy overpriced designer clothes online today have their origins in Cold War era funding. Talk about the butterfly effect. Postgres was officially released in 1996 and gained a reputation for being robust, reliable and feature-rich. Just a few years later, the industry experienced the famous dot-com bubble. The wide adoption of the internet brought with it a huge wave of unstructured data. Relational databases, designed for structured, predictable data, started to show their limitations. Enter the era of not only SQL databases, or, as the DB purists call them, no standards query language databases. A particularly interesting development was Google's Big Table, a distributed storage system introduced in 2004. It wasn't technically a database in the traditional sense, but laid the groundwork for modern distributed data systems. Inspired by Bigtable, Facebook created Cassandra, and Apache Hadoop introduced HBase. These systems were designed to handle enormous amounts of data across multiple servers, something relational databases couldn't do efficiently at the time. This is when cloud computing also started to gain traction. Services like Amazon RDS made databases accessible to everyone as long as you can handle the fees. The 2010s marked the rise of new SQL databases, which aimed to bridge the gap between the reliability of relational databases and the scalability of NoSQL. Another groundbreaking innovation was the concept of graph databases. Neo4j, for instance, became popular for its ability to model relationships and connections, making it perfect for use cases like social networks, fraud detection, and recommendation systems. With ever-growing user bases and the constant need to serve data faster, caching mechanisms became the norm in the Internet era and in-memory databases became indispensable tools in modern software architectures. Today, databases are more diverse than ever. We have time series databases like InfluxDB for monitoring IoT devices, blockchain databases for decentralized systems and hybrid solutions that combine the best of relational and NoSQL worlds. On top of that, serverless databases like Amazon Aurora and Firebase take scalability and ease of use to the next level. From punch cards to AI-driven systems, databases have come a long way. They've transformed how we store and process information, shaping everything from how we shop online to how scientists explore space. If you enjoy this type of content, check out some of my other videos covering tech history and innovations. Until next time, thank you for watching.